Alright guys, welcome to another video from XF Motorsports. This is going to be part 2 of Project XF1 in which we're taking a Mercedes S500 and uh, in the last video well, we took it apart and like took the engine apart completely and we're turning it into a Mercedes F1 car or something close enough to a Mercedes F1 car. Uh, so yeah, in the last video we took the engine out of the car, we analyzed some of the components on it and um, in this video we're going to be starting off by making the pistons for the car and Matthew who has been helping me out over here, he's an engineering student and um, yeah he's been uh, spending some time over here helping me with some of the design work. Uh, he's going to explain how we're going to make the pistons. So first we started with the pistons directly from the engine. We took all of the measurements with the uh, CNC machine and we're going to take that into Fusion and try and create a better piston that can improve the uh, strength of it, reduce the weight a little bit, and change the compression ratio, which is what we need to get the power that we need out of the project. And essentially, we will take this piece of aluminum and turn it into the new pistons. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, during the process of like analyzing different components, I also we also took measurements from the block, analyzed how strong the open dead block would be, also the connecting rods, basically finding out what were the weak points on this engine so that we can like change the appropriate things we need to change on it, but uh, not waste time changing things that were not needed to be like uh, replaced. So basically, yeah, we analyzed that um, the block itself is good for holding 190 bar of cylinder pressure. Uh, the pistons were good for 150 bar and the connecting rods were good for 130 bar, depending how they fail, because they can fail a few different ways. Uh, but basically from that, what we analyzed was that the piston was the main thing that we needed to redesign to lower the compression ratio, to reduce the cylinder pressure, to uh, run the boost that we actually wanted to run. And there's a couple of cool things about the design, I guess, that I'll uh, talk a bit later in the video, but um, uh, yeah, let's start off by showing you guys the design of the piston, then putting this block in the machine and actually getting to making it. So for designing our piston, we actually started off by designing the Mercedes piston, the original piston that came in this engine, in the same software first, because um, even though we're designing our own piston and we're going to be making it from scratch, and there's quite a few things that we're changing on it, uh, there are still a few design constraints that we had to take from this piston that we would be limited to. Uh, like for example the size of the wrist pin, the location of um, uh, the wrist pin retainer clips that go over here, um, the clearance at the bottom so the piston doesn't hit the crankshaft when it goes all the way up. So it was a good idea to actually design the Mercedes pistons first and um, after actually designing them we also simulated how they would actually uh, behave when they were subjected to well the type of loads that we're going to be putting the engine under so uh, we not only simulated the factory ones we also simulated the amg pistons the one that came in the supercharged variant of the same engine and um, of course these ones were uh, surprisingly not any stronger than the uh, naturally aspirated ones but they are slightly lighter than uh, the naturally aspirated ones the bigger change is that they actually have a lower compression ratio these ones have a compression ratio of uh, 9 to 1 whereas these ones are 10.5 to 1 but after simulating the pistons, what we found out was that, of course, the Mercedes design was not the most optimized design in terms of, well, piston designs. This is actually, a, well, you can see the cross-section of the AMG piston over here for the, from this broken one. You can see the masses of weight that they've actually um, added on this piston. This top part of the piston is 9 millimeters thick. It's so thick that I've been able to machine away 2 millimeters of that, and I'm, I still abuse this engine, and still nothing actually happens to it because... There was so much more material put into it from the beginning, especially when you compare it to like an F1 piston. This piston is actually uh, from an actual F1 car, from a world championship winning F1 car. This one was from the um, 2001 Ferrari F1. Um, it's actually a race used piston. Uh, but what you see on this piston design is that look at how thin all their little um, webbing and everything is. Look at how thin the uh, side walls are. Look at well, the whole piston is really thin. And also the some of the measurements that I have, uh, I know from this piston is that the top of this piston is pretty much just four millimeters thick at some places. So. Um, that's extremely thin well compared to the nine millimeters that the Mercedes piston is and of course this engine was making 700 horsepower with this little piston inside it. This is one piston that we unfortunately didn't analyze yet but uh, if you guys want to see a video on this one later this is something that I'd love to also design in the software and see how this one was performing under load and everything because I'm pretty sure that we will see much better results with this one than we saw with the Mercedes ones, but anyways, uh, showing you guys uh, our design process and the piston that we actually ended up with. So after we knew what all our design constraints were and all the things that we could not have changed in the engine, we basically designed that in the software and after that we used something called generative design. Generative design is when you 
tell the software all your constraints and all the forces that your piston is going to be subjected to. The software then basically goes through many different iterations and comes out with the design that is the best possible design possibly possible for your applications. So yeah, using different forces and different uh, simulations, uh, we got different results, but basically uh, the more most commonly repeated result we got was a piston with this round ring around the uh, wrist pin things and then tiny ribs uh, going out from it to the skirts and uh, yeah this was the design that was the most repeated of course it was not a design that would be easily machinable or uh, something that we could actually make and the coolest thing is that when you actually compare that to the f1 piston you actually see that the f1 piston is actually doing the same thing they also have this round circle around the wrist pin and tiny ribs going from that um, holding the skirt and um, also supporting this part of the um, dish from here. So that was all really good but of course the problem with generative design is that it doesn't really give you designs that would be too easy to manufacture or possible at all to manufacture. You can specify the machines that you're using to make it and it will actually uh, sometimes come up with shapes that you can actually machine on your specific machine and stuff but it's actually not as sophisticated as they say it is and um, it doesn't know all the special tools and tricks and fixtures that you can use to achieve shapes that um, it would think that are not possible in your machine but you can actually machine so we only use generative design as a starting point and after that we started designing our own piston taking cues from the generative design of course but um, then doing our own simulations and um, finding out how the piston would work so after designing our piston we did a bunch of simulations on it and then we slowly started taking weight away from uh, where it was not being used and adding more material where it was being used and um, so after all that work this was the final design that we actually ended up with and it's a really cool design looks completely different from any other piston or anything that you see out there um, and of course this is not a, just something that is made to look cool it's um, a result of um, trying to optimize the shape as much as possible for our purpose and um, this is yeah what we ended up with the final piston this design actually weighs 425 grams it's about 25 grams lighter than the factory piston that it's going to be replacing but while the factory piston is only strong enough for 150 bar of cylinder pressure this piston is actually good for 250 bar of cylinder pressure a really significant improvement in strength uh, while still keeping the piston lighter than the factory one it's also going to be extremely good for high RPM because well the lighter weight means that it's not going to overstress the connecting rod bolts and it also means that um, the piston itself can hold itself together all the way up to 11,000 RPM. So this piston with the connecting rods and everything um, bolted inside the engine will be able to go up to 11,000 RPM before anything will fail. So that is pretty amazing and um, on top of that also the top of the piston the design on the top is completely different from the Mercedes one. This is actually um, properly designed for the Mercedes head so it clears the intake and exhaust valve so it provides us uh, more valve clearance so that we can actually play around with the valve timing run extra valve duration if that's needed and if in case we even run into valve float um, revving the engine so high um, we wouldn't really have any problems uh, with our uh, valves running into our piston so um, yeah there's a lot of benefits that this uh, piston design provides for our purpose but of course now that the design is done and the next part is well the even more difficult part actually going and making this piston so well there's a few steps involved in making it we're gonna start off by machining the bottom side and then well you guys are actually gonna see the full process so so now that everything with the piston design and all the g-code is generated next it's just time to put this uh, block of aluminum in the machine and um, well after quite a few steps we're gonna hopefully end up with a piston that is gonna look well not something like this but uh, close enough to this and then it's gonna be time to actually uh, put it in the engine and uh, check all the dimensions and everything piston to wall clearance valve clearance and uh, see if all that actually works this first one is just gonna be a prototype so we're gonna use um, well all the tools that are in the machine right now and uh, see how it goes and then if once the dimensions and everything come out properly then we're going to machine the other eight with the same code and uh, hopefully end up with a set of pistons that is going to work amazing for this engine. Okay, so our first attempt of making the piston didn't really work out. We didn't check the G-code carefully enough and there was one fault. Um, the tool basically, yeah, uh, was cutting a pocket and then it ran into the part itself and it um, not only 
uh, made the tool slip but also uh, made this part slip on the fixture so the whole thing actually when you look at it it's not in the thing properly so basically yeah now we need to go back to the code we need to fix that fault then uh, this part is unfortunately wasted but um, it was a trial piece anyways but now we only have one more test piece left that we need to get right um, and yeah let's try to get everything right for that one So after a full day of machining, here's the result. We have ended up with, well, not even half a piston, but <laughs> we're getting there. Um, so yeah, so far, this, everything is looking pretty good. Um, this is the connecting rod. We were checking the uh, connecting rod clearance while well, we did it on that one, and uh, the clearance is the same as what it was on the factory rod, so that's all good. Uh, but after this point, there's a few more steps that are still left, of course, to change this thing into a piston so it needs to go in the machine sideways now and then we need to drill the well machine the holes for the uh, wrist pin to go in and also a few more features on the side that uh, weren't possible to machine from the top Here's a look at the piston after the sides are machined and uh, yeah now you can see the wrist pin hole over there also the little uh, wrist pin retainer grooves those are also machined and uh, yeah the wrist pin goes in uh, fairly firm right now it's something that I might change for the um, final uh, pistons when I make those and also the I haven't left a groove for taking out the retainer like um, these Mercedes ones had it's something that I might also change to make it easier for uh, removing the uh, retainer clips when you actually put those in so uh, for this one this is just a prototype I'm uh, making it to get to get all the process and also the sizes and everything right so um, that's why I didn't bother making that effort but for the final ones I will definitely do those extra steps and probably even open up the clearances for the wrist pin so that it's easier to um, actually put in <laughs> but other than that once the wrist pin does go in all the yeah wrist pin grooves and everything line up properly just like they do on the mercedes piston and next uh, what's left on the piston is now it has to go in the machine this way so that the machine can actually uh well machine the top part of the piston and for that there's another fixture that i made that is gonna um yeah fit into this little groove that i left on the piston and um, there's another, uh, well that fixture actually uses these two holes that we just machined to actually hold it to the fixture. And uh, then, yeah, basically the sides and the top are gonna be accessible at the same time. It's the same trick that uh, Mercedes used for their pistons, actually not, uh, well, Mala, the company that makes pistons for Mercedes. Uh, they always also have uh, this little bit of a groove over here so that they can actually bolt the piston just using this thing and the wrist pin to like the lathe machine or CNC, whichever they use and uh, then machine the sides and the top at the same time. So yeah, let's uh, get to that and see how much longer it takes to turn this thing into a full piston. <laughs> Here's what the piston looks like after the top is machined and it's looking really cool. It's finally starting to look well exactly like it was in the design. You can see those that shape on the top for um, getting better valve clearance and uh, yeah everything pretty much looks like in the design but well the only thing that uh, is left right now is just machining the sides because the sides are a little bigger than uh, what they're supposed to be right now they're at uh, 98 millimeters but the final size needs to be 97 point something millimeters to achieve its final piston to wall clearance and also to uh, give the side walls their final taper because um, they are not supposed to be cylindrical they're supposed to um, taper inwards by a specific angle and everything and uh, yeah the shape on the sides is probably the most critical thing 
um, to get right on a piston. That's why yeah, this step needs to be performed with extreme precision and to make sure that uh, we get a result that will uh, work really well. Uh, on the same step when we're machining the sides, we're also going to be adding the piston ring grooves, which uh, is going to be a little tricky because the piston ring grooves are going to look kind of like this. Uh, the top one is really thin and a really deep groove, so uh, machining that is going to be pretty difficult. And um, I actually need to cut a tool. I, um, I need to uh, grind another tool to actually make it, which is actually going to be that thin and that long so that it can actually uh, cut that groove. For doing this step, uh, the piston is not going to be mounted in the machine, it's actually going to be mounted with the spindle. So we're going to kind of use the machine like a lathe machine. We've made this um, special fixture for it that's going to hold the piston to the spindle. And uh, then there's going to be a tool that is going to be clamped on the vise and then it's going to come in from the sides and uh, basically, yeah, it's just going to work like a lathe machine and it's going to uh, machine the sides, give them their final shape and taper and piston ring grooves. And then finally, we're going to end up with our final piston and I cannot even wait for that. <laughs> Here's a final look at the piston after everything is done on it and it is looking beyond cool. Look at this, like this thing actually looks like a proper piston now. It has the same texture on the sides that, um, well, pistons have and uh, yeah, the piston to wall clearance is right on all the piston ring grooves. Um, I've already tried putting the piston rings in, it, they go in perfectly. Um, these piston rings are performance piston rings, they're not the um, uh, same piston rings that the AMG engines come with, but they're of a really similar size to uh, what these AMG pistons come with. So even the um, AMG piston rings will work with this piston and uh, vice versa, these pistons also will pretty much work with the uh, factory AMG piston. But um, other than that, yeah, this thing is looking really cool. Just look at it compared to an F1 piston. This is pretty much, I guess, the closest you can get to an F1 piston without actually uh, making an F1 piston. And of course, this is not down to um, us copying the dimensions or anything from the F1 piston. It was just the nature of the design. Um, we were trying to like get a more efficient, better piston taking out weight from wherever it had to be taken out, going out with a shape that could actually be machined and be really strong and lightweight. And of course, we ended up with a design that actually does look really similar to the F1 piston. Not from the top, because of course, uh, from the top, our purpose was a little different than uh, the F1 piston. They had a four valve engine, whereas we had a three valve engine. So of course, um, our valve clearances, um, to clear them, we had to go with a different design. And of course, the head design is completely different than it would have been on the F1 engine. And of course, their compression ratio is completely different than what it would have been on that engine. So. For our purpose, this is pretty much like the best piston we could have made. And the even more amazing thing is that it actually turned out to be lighter than uh, what the design said it would be. The design said it would be 425 kilograms, but actually it has turned out to be 416 grams. Um, this is not down to us taking more material off it or something. I measured all the dimensions, they're right on, right according to the design. Um, but this difference in weight is probably just down to the density of the material. So it was actually less dense than what the software uh, thought it would be. Um, and the factory uh, pistons that came out of this engine, they of course weigh quite a lot more than this. They weigh 447, 48 grams. <laughs> and uh, the AMG pistons are a little lighter. These ones are the ones that you find on the AMG variant of this engine. They weigh 438 uh, grams. And my pistons, these are the pistons that I was using in uh, my car that I am using in that car that uh, I machined myself uh, based on these AMG pistons. Basically, I would only machine the top surface down to reduce the compression ratio. And these ones weigh 
quite a bit lighter. They weigh 424 grams, and um, but of course this one takes things to a whole different level. These pistons are actually capable of 11,000 RPM um, working with this engine. <laughs> so the bottom end with these pistons is going to be good to go for that high of an RPM. And of course the valve clearances are better, so even if we run into valve float, um, if we can actually make this head flow that well, we can go extremely high with the RPM. So um be really happy with how things have turned out and uh well now uh, the thing we have to do is that uh, we have to um, actually put this piston inside the engine uh, this first one is of course uh, like i mentioned it's a prototype it's not um, the final batch of eight pistons that i'm going to be making but for checking everything and making a hundred percent sure that everything is going to be okay we're going to be putting this piston uh, in the engine uh, with all the uh, piston rings connecting rod and everything just like it would finally go in the engine and then we're going to be measuring the deck clearance, the compression ratio, the valve clearance, and all the things that you usually need to check for pistons. And uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to be fine because uh, everything is according to what it was in the design. And of course, we checked the design a million times before actually making it. But it's still an extra step to make a million percent sure that everything is going to be fine before we go on and make a whole batch of pistons for this engine. So yeah, let's do that quickly. And then we will yeah, get on to making eight more of these pistons. So now finally the piston is inside the engine and uh, here's how it moves up and down just like um, well the piston would move up and down so it's really cool to see that this thing actually started off like a solid block of aluminum at the beginning of this video and after all that machining it's pretty much a functional piston now so um, yeah really cool and of course it clears everything we were checking um, at the bottom of course that it clears the crankshaft the oil squirters the oil squirter was the only thing we had to bend a little bit out of the way so that the piston doesn't uh, hit it when it goes all the way down and um, other than that everything is looking really good uh, the taper on these pistons is slightly more than the factory ones so uh, basically what that is is uh, when you look at the top of the piston you can see that kind of see that um, little gap on the top um, so when I move this piston upwards you'll see that gap close uh, that gap is there because um, when the, the, the piston is actually running inside the engine, the piston heats up, well the top of the piston heats up more than all the rest of it, um, so it's going to expand and that gap is going to close. But if that gap is not big enough, then of course when the piston expands, it's going to start hitting the cylinder walls and it's going to scratch up the cylinder walls in no time at all. Uh, on our piston, that taper is a little bigger and um, you can kind of see that gap is bigger than the factory one, but it's only like a 20% difference, so it's not like a too, too obvious difference. So. Um, it's probably not going to have any like um, significant piston slap or anything. Piston slap is when your engine is cold and you're driving it hard. Sometimes the pistons rock back and forth and they hit the cylinder walls, um, causing a noise. But um, I think with this little um, taper and uh, piston to wall clearance, I don't think that's going to be an issue at all. So um, yeah, all that is looking pretty good. Next, what we need to do is that we need to uh, put the head on with a few of the valves in there so that we can actually check the valve clearance, see if the valves are hitting the pistons at the proper point and how much the valves can open when the piston is all the way at top dead center. That's of course something that is going to be a massive improvement over the factory piston because this one was not even designed for valve clearance. All the, uh, the shape on the top does not even clear the valves properly. So, so yeah, let's put the head on and uh, yeah, see how that goes. So after measuring the valve clearance, the results are also looking really good. So you can kind of see the um, slight mark that the exhaust valve um, left over there on the pistons. That's where the exhaust valve was hitting. And um, this is where the 
intake valve was hitting it's hard to show you the mark once that little mark over there is where the intake valve was hitting so uh, that's actually perfect it actually lines up exactly where the pockets were on the piston so uh, of course that helps us um, get way more uh, valve clearance that means the valves will actually need to go much further down before they actually hit hit the piston and the number for the exhaust side was uh, nine millimeters and the number for the intake valve was six millimeters so I believe the exhaust valves are already non-interference at this point and the intake valves are pretty much close to non-interference um, I think the valve total valve travel on this head is somewhere around seven to eight millimeters I haven't measured it yet but I will measure it really soon when I do some more work on that head but um, yeah these are pretty good numbers this means that we can really play around with the valve timing do whatever it takes to uh, make this engine flow better and of course it means that while revving this engine extremely high even if it does run into valve float um, there's almost no chance of the valves hitting the piston which of course wouldn't have been a case with these pistons because um, these ones don't even have a pocket made for the exhaust valve so if the exhaust valve actually hit the piston it would have hit it right here and if the intake valves hit the piston they actually do fit inside the pocket which is pretty good to see because on the AMG pistons um, even that is not the case because the pockets are actually wrong the piston actually um, hits uh, the valve actually hits the piston at like somewhere over here on the side of the pocket so on this piston the intake valves can actually move about 2.4 millimeters before they will hit the piston but um, of course even that is not enough to uh, give you any room to play around with valve timing or um, if in case like you pit valve float of course then your valves are running straight into the piston and <laughs> that's going to cause a lot of damage so um, I think yeah this design is going to provide us a lot of benefit for uh, what we're doing with this engine taking it to extremely high rpm and um, well the next step of actually taking it to extremely high rpm is making an oiling system that will actually uh, help the engine stay reliable at those higher rpms making sure that we don't spin a bearing or something so in the next video we're going to be making a dry sump for it so for now i'm going to leave the engine assembled like it is um yeah in the next video i'm going to be flipping the engine over putting the oil pans back on i have already uh, started work on the dry sump uh, i have already made the gears for it um, the shafts that will actually run in the pump are already here and i've also started designing the housing and everything but uh, i just want to make sure that everything that i'm doing will actually fit this engine and will work properly um, and clear everything um, underneath so uh, I'm going to be doing that next and you guys are going to be seeing all that in the next video. It's a really cool dry sump by the way. It's not one of those aftermarket uh, dry sumps that are belt driven and the pump sits outside the engine. This is a fully internal dry sump, chain driven. The, the pump and the scavenging pumps all sit underneath the engine uh, just like it is in the Mercedes McLaren SLR um, because they're also running a dry sump in that car uh, on a really similar engine to this one. That one has an M115 engine whereas this one is an M113 engine which M115 is an engine um, pretty much based on an M113 engine with a slightly different block and a dry sump system. So of course um, getting the oiling right with this one I think the bottom end and everything well at this part of the engine is going to be really good to go for high rpm and um, that's only going to leave the question for the heads then how well we can actually make them flow and of course how high we will be able to go before we hit valve float on those heads so of course we're going to be doing some more work on the heads later then and then um, after that it's just going to be a matter of putting this whole engine together, um, pairing it with two massive turbos, making a custom intake manifold for it, and then hoping for really good numbers with this engine. Um, I guess you guys will see the numbers really soon because we are going to be putting this on an engine dyno and measuring the power of whatever it makes at the end. So, But yeah, hopefully, yeah, I'm hoping for big numbers, something close to 900 horsepower with this one. So um, yeah, you guys are going to see that um, hopefully soon. Uh, well, before that, you guys are actually going to see another engine, AMG engine going into, well, that car, the uh, Mercedes SL. This one is an M156 engine from a C63, the 6.2 liter uh, Mercedes V8, which... Um, yeah, and we were doing quite a bit of work trying to make it fit in this Mercedes SL, which of course uh, was not as easy as uh, we expected. <laughs> it's going to be quite a lot of uh, cutting and welding that needs to be done in this engine bay to make it slightly bigger, to make it clear everything. And also quite a lot of cutting and welding that we are doing on the subframe to actually make the engine fit on the subframe. And then, yeah, hopefully in the next video you guys are going to see some more work being done on this car. And, um, you know, hopefully then seeing getting this one to run soon enough so yeah quite a lot of work going on actually in the shop um quite a few cool things coming up for you guys so definitely stay tuned this is going to be everything for now i will see you guys in the next one